Hello everyone, Whitney here and welcome to Mountain Climbers. I am so excited for you to hear the amazing testimony of the one and only Bethany Jett. Let me tell you, Bethany is a trailblazer. With many books published, two successful companies, Serious Writer and Platinum Faith, and a master's in communications, she seems unstoppable. But guess what? A mountain formed in her life that tried to stop her. And you know, that's how mountains are. They are not a respecter of any person, and they don't respect what season of life you're in. And, and what's interesting to me is how mountains vary. Some mountains come and they only attack one area of a person's life. Or some mountains form, like they did for Bethany, and they attack the very essence of who you are and why God put you on this earth. But from the get-go, Bethany determined that she would not quit. And her message resonated with me in the season of life I am in. And, and I know it's going to resonate with you, and I know a lot of us can say, that we're so glad that Bethany did not quit because of the impact she's had on our writing ministry and in the writing world and how we have advanced because of the time and effort she's put into our lives. So we're going to now join her via Zoom. And I know that your heart is going to bloom with this profound truth. And that is sometimes the mountaintop victory doesn't come through healing. Sometimes the mountain does not disappear, but the mountaintop victory comes because you didn't quit, you persevered, and you never stopped climbing. Hey, Bethany, thank you so much for coming on Mountain Climbers. Thank you for having me. You are so welcome. So this has been a long time in coming to get you on here. And I just, I am so excited. I cannot wait for people to hear your story. And I think what I love the most is that, you know, we talked about this. Mountains sometimes just fight or attack one area of someone's life. But then some mountains, like you're experiencing, attacks the very essence of who you are and the purpose that God's put you on this earth for, and that's tough. And so yeah. I'm, I'm really excited for you to speak to those people who are going through a similar type of mountain so they can keep climbing and keep doing what God put them on this earth to do. So thank you. And we're just going to dive right in. And uh, first, just tell a little bit about yourself, where you're from, where you're, you live, a little bit about your family. Well, I live in Tampa and Really, we love Florida, hurricanes and all, <laughs> a lot of wet weather, and um, my husband's in the military, although we were in ministry um, for a long time before that, he was in the military when I met him, Yeah, ministry, military again, so it's kind of bookended that for us, so we've got three boys, and you know, I definitely love being a boy mom, I yeah. think I've grown into the role, <laughs> it's much much different than I anticipated, there's a lot of testosterone in my house. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I want to say thank you for your husband's service. Uh, oh, really appreciate what he does for our country. And, you know, I know it's not only a sacrifice on, you know, his part, but his family's part um, as well for you, like, you know, to move around and, you know, that kind of thing. So yeah. thank you for that. And, you know, uh, moving around can especially be hard because of what you do. And um, so when did your love for writing come about? And I have to ask this, do you think it came about because your mom is Johnny Alexander, a very successful fiction writer? Do you think that helped foster your writing love? Yeah, I do. You know, it's so fun because a lot of people, because we have different last names, they don't put us together as like mother, daughter, you know, authors. But she and my husband really were the two people who encouraged me to write to kind of follow that passion. And she was still in the middle of that journey herself, like getting her agent and her books and things going. And um, she suggested going to a writer's conference and she couldn't go that year. And I think it, it was kind of a good thing that she wasn't there because, um, you know, you kind of like to do things on your own, you know? And so I feel like, okay, I got it. Like she encouraged it, but then I did it myself. One of those little things. Yeah, but, I get it. 
she's um she and just Justin, my husband, uh-huh. they just kept saying you need to you need to try, you need to go do this. And that conference changed my life. I mean, that's my first book came from that conference. My first agent came from that conference, and that was really like the pivotal moment for me when everything changed. And um, but it's fun because my mom's a novelist and yeah. I write um, nonfiction, and so we've it's been fun to compare the journeys, the craft, the yeah. art, ha- the difference in platform, like all those kinds of things. Yeah. And so she understands the writer's world, you know, like the, yeah. the things we talk about, there's someone to talk about that mm-hmm. stuff with. Yeah, well, that's really cool. And you mentioned that, you know, you, in a way, we're glad that you did that conference on your own because you, yeah. know, you got to do on your own, figure out, okay, who is Bethany Jett as a writer? And you didn't follow your mom's path, like you said. Yeah. You chose nonfiction devotional writing, ghost writing. How did you make that choice? Um, really, it, it was because we were in youth ministry and we had um, a cycle of kids. And I don't, if anyone's in ministry, you might, especially youth ministry, you've got the sixth grade to 12th grade is who yeah. we were in charge of. And we'd seen these kids go from like sixth, seventh grade all the way into senior year of their high school. So this was what we considered one of our cycles, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And um, we were super close to these kids because we'd been with them for the last six, seven years. And the girls were getting ready to go to college and I just remember thinking you know they're not going to call me like they do now like this relationship is about to change and maybe I should just put some stuff online for them like I don't know that they'll ever go read it but at least I can tell them like listen (laughs) here's the dating advice is really what I was thinking about so I just started this like this little blog that didn't really go far with just some things I wanted them to know yeah. And then I drafted that into a proposal and took that to the writer's conference. And that book became the Cinderella Rule. Yeah, that's so cool. So that's essentially what moved you to write that beautiful Christian living book, the Cinderella Rule. Yes, it was for them. So can you share just a little bit about what that is, the Cinderella Rule? Yes. Okay, so the Cinderella Rule is really a book on confidence for young women and it kind of leads them through being single, confidence, you know, and we also talk about modesty, femininity, but it also goes deep into dating, um, things to look for, things like red flags, um, all the way up until engagement. So it kind of spans that, that whole process. Yeah. That's, that's very much needed. I, (laughs) yeah. And now I'm like, my brain's going like 90 miles an hour thinking like, Ooh, what teenagers can I buy this book for now? So, yeah, society definitely needs that um, this day and age. But you know, like that's your book, baby, and that that story, that you know, devotional. I mean, it exploded like your like career and your your you know calling. And you know, like now, you know, you have several books written. You've won many awards. You have two mm-hmm. successful businesses serious writer in in platinum faith and you got a master's is it is it it communications is that what it is yes okay so oh my goodness like I like I'm in awe like I I look at what you do and I'm like whoa how does she do it all and so I have to ask like you know looking back does it does it seem surreal like the doors that God's opened the, the divine appointments that he's orchestrated for you yeah absolutely because before I went to that writer's conference, you know, I hadn't finished my undergrad yet, and I was still really struggling with purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, I loved being a stay-at-home mom. I was very involved in Justin's youth ministry. I was um, coaching high school cheerleading. We were very involved in the community, but I just constantly, and it sounds terrible to say out loud, but I constantly felt like there was something more, like God created me for something more, but I didn't know what it was. Yeah. And so that, that's why, you know, and I almost didn't go to that writer's conference. I was scared. I didn't, you know, I had every excuse, so, you know, I don't have a, I didn't know what platform was. I was just saying like, nobody knows me. Who's going to read me? Like, I don't have any credentials, all those things. And um, it was because I had applied for a scholarship um, because my mom and Justin had pushed me to do that. So I had received one and because I didn't want to waste it where someone else could have taken that spot it's the only reason I went yeah and um because I'm an introvert like I like to be home and that was scary so and that and that was God saying this was what I've created for you and it's just been a whirlwind Uh ever since with the companies and everything yeah and you mentioned uh scholarship um writer's conference 
is who, who do that. That is such a huge blessing because uh, I got a scholarship to go to write to publish last yeah. year. And that's where God gave me the idea for mountain climbers. I it, love that. It would have never happened if I didn't go to, I mean, I'm sure it would have at some point, but that's when God wanted that I did and so like I, I think that's something you know I love that you're putting out there sometimes you have to do it scared God's pushing yes. you out of your comfort zone for something more and you might not get that more you know if you don't it's always better to be in his perfect will and not his permissive will so but here you are you know things are just going like you know from this venture to this venture God just opened up all these doors and then this mountain forms and, yes. And, you know, like, mountains are no respecters of person. They don't care who you are. They don't care what season of life you're in or what's going on for you. That's just how they are. So when did you realize that your hands were starting to crack open? Just like, something's not right. I remember exactly when it was because we had, we were on the drive from Florida to Mississippi. Uh -huh. um, Justin was enrolled in a six month program over at Keesler Air Force Base. So we were moving. Yeah. And I was driving my friend's car, like the whole eight hours, whatever, nine hours through the night. And um, I remember like, you know, when your skin just gets dry or whatever, um, I have this like kind of this like crack in my skin right here on my thumb. And I thought it was from the steering wheel. Yeah. Um, just maybe I was just touched it for too long or leather. Yeah. I didn't know, but it never like really like healed. It just kind of like got worse. And then my other hand started to do it in that weird spot. And so, you know, it just increasingly got worse and worse and worse. And then I had gone to the doctor and, you know, it was just, they diagnosed it as um, maybe eczema or yeah. dermatitis. And it wasn't until about three, two to three years of dealing with it that I finally saw a dermatologist yeah because we had moved I mean so part of it is three years I just thought it was like two or three four or five six months I didn't realize it was that long it was a long time it was a whole time we were in Biloxi and then like with military insurance like his um status kept changing because he's in the National Guard but he's also active duty so like our insurance would change or he tried to get an appointment but then we were going to be moving back and finding new providers and yeah. I again I just thought it was some yeah. kind of whatever yeah. so um finally though when we got settled back in here I, I, in Tampa went back to the doctor which I hated doing they referred me to a dermatologist his name was Dr. T was what I called him and yeah. he was wonderful and he's the one who really I was praying that God would give me somebody who could kind of explore this with me and not write it off yeah and so I just remember he looked at my hands and he said um, he said, you have healthy pinkies. <laughs> I was like, okay. And he's like, that Thank tells me you. that, yeah. And uh, ring fingers, you know, these two fingers were, were healthy. He called yeah. them. And so he said, I can tell by the patterns. And he said a couple words I don't know. He mm -hmm. said, I can tell by this, that you're touching something and we need to figure out what that is. So they did like a skin nickel test because that's a common allergy, came back negative. Yeah. And so he ordered a full panel. Um, two panels actually I think he did an extra one mm -hmm. on my back like for patch testing mm -hmm. yeah. and so the result of that there's like a few things that I have um skin allergies to but the big one was colophony which is in everything so here we are <laughs> yeah and that's essentially paper isn't it it's used in the manufacturing um of paper it's in anything that coats or waterproof so photos magazines book covers um, it's in plastics. I don't think it's in BP. I think it's not in BPA free things. So like I've tried transitioning to BPA yeah. free stuff. Um, it makes the plastic hard, I guess, is the ingredient. It's yeah. essentially pine resin. So it's just used in literally ink, uh, like inks, stickers, adhesives, life. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and the big thing that the component that it's used in is your life. Like, I mean, is. thinking of your, your planner projects, your, you mm -hmm. know, like the magazines you do, the books, and I mean, like, I, I can't imagine, that had to, as a writer, that had to be a blow, knowing yeah. that that's what you were allergic to. I mean, what were the emotions that were going through you when you heard? You know, I remember calling Kyle and Michelle, who are, a couple, you know, they're yeah. some of my best friends, and my husband, my mom, and I just remember saying, 
if if this comes back and I'm allergic to paper, like he thought maybe it was the formaldehyde that's used in paper. I mean, that was something that we were talking about. I said, that's going to be the craziest thing ever. And I really didn't think it was going to come back because like normal paper, it just kind of friction is all it is. Like I can touch it without a problem. But if you go up from like the 20 pound weight of paper to like the slicker mm -hmm. stuff, that colophony is used in that, I guess. So anyway, when it came back, it was just kind of like, um, okay, <laughs> okay, yeah. God. But like, I kind of feel sometimes that Satan attacks, you know, the, the place where your purpose is. And so I just kind of saw it as, mm -hmm. I'm going to do this anyway. Yeah. So you never, I want to ask this because, you know, some people might have this thought, like you said, when Satan attacks the very purpose that you, you know, God put you on this earth to do. Did you ever think like, okay, is this worth it? Do I need to find something yeah. else to do? No. I thought, how can I market at this? Yeah. <laughs> so That's like good. for a while I had an author yeah. with a paper allergy, but I don't think people believe me actually. Yeah. Cause I did have that online for a while and it's just mm -hmm. so weird. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I have it on my website, like I said, but I thought, okay, how am I just going to take this and then make it be yeah. something better than what it could be? Yeah. No, it never, it never caused me to want to stop. That's great. And that, that, that's huge for people because they need to hear that and know like, you know, Satan wants you to quit. That's why he attacks you and you can't quit. You got to say, okay, like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to figure this out and, you know, do like what I, you know, improvise, do what I can. And, you know, so like, I can't imagine how exhausting it was the trial and error trying to figure out, okay, what precautions do I take so that my hands can function mm -hmm. and still like do what God's called me to do? Like how, how did you put that plan together? So there, as far as I know, with the research I've done and what the doctor said, there's no cure for it. Like the only thing you can do is prevent touching it, Yeah. but like it's in everything. <laughs> so like, um, so I did, I pulled out some gloves. So like, I love these gloves they're like hairdresser gloves oh yeah um, but I can still touch my phone through it like it's still yeah. got enough of the heat or whatever but I hate wearing them so yeah I mean I don't wear them as much as I should so even right now like my hands are so like having some issues there's a there is like a prescription steroid that does help but like you can only use it so many days and then it's not really great to be taking it if you don't have to so I try not to take it yeah, yeah. but um even washing my hands with soap like it dries them out just oh yeah but I mean, I think what it's done for me, honestly, is it, I don't know how to say it, like people's excuses for not doing anything. Like yeah. I have much less tolerance now for that kind of thing. Cause when Michelle and I were working on our books, we had two books released around the same time yeah. and we we're, we're at our retreat and my hands are literally bleeding like my fingertips. Cause, um, one reason why it's hard to get them to heal enough because I'm always typing. Yeah. And so like the friction of the keyboard is constantly wearing through the skin. So I'm literally like have, I have like eight bandages like on my fingertips as I'm like trying to write this book. Yeah. So like if people say things like, Oh, you know, like I can't, I'm like, if I can do this, you know, with bloody fingers then you can do it <laughs> yeah I mean that I mean that's true like I mean God will give you the strength you might feel like you can't go on mm -hmm. but that's the moment he gives you just enough strength to get to the next mountain trail and then the next mountain yeah trail until you can you know get to the top and so like I one thing I love about platinum faith you talked about how you know you, you pushed through and you kept climbing. But one thing I love that you and Michelle do with Platinum Faith, you ask your clients, what's a win for you? So mm -hmm. I want to know during this climb, what's been some wins for you? I think like, um, like you said, I just graduated from my math, you know, getting my master's and doing that um, while Justin was deployed for a good portion of that and having yeah. kids and homeschooling. I think it, pushed me to where my boundary was mm -hmm. um like how much I could do and I think I naturally have workaholic tendencies like mm -hmm. I'm an Enneagram three through and through <laughs> like when it comes to, like achievement orient you know being achievement oriented and everything like that and so I think that God's teaching me now how to balance the rest but I'm thankful that I pushed myself as hard as I did 
mm-hmm. because now I know where the boundary is. And yeah. as I coach people and consult, I think a lot of people don't ever push themselves even close to the point where they could go. Yeah. But it was because I was willing to do that, that God let me set foundations for so many things that now he's starting to water and we're seeing growth in those areas. And so I think that that's the win was yeah. pushing through and trying to figure out where my limits were. Yeah. And I think I'm glad you brought that out. I mean, that's so huge. We can't do it all. We want to do it all, but we can't. And we have to learn what our limits are and what our body's telling us what we can do and what we can't do. But then at the same time, you know, sometimes we have to keep pushing even when we don't feel like it because we'll never know if we can surpass this current. Yeah. And so I, I love that you brought that out. And, you know, one thing I want to know is, it's been tough. Like I didn't realize that it was three years. I thought it was, you know, like three to six months, you know, of constant like pushing doctors and, you know, like I need answers, that kind of thing. I didn't realize it was that long of a mountain climb for you. Yeah. So what I would love to know is how did God assure you and sustain you during that climb to let you know, like, okay, this is hard. You're not getting the answers that you need to get you. There's a lot of unknown, but you're on the exact path that I want you to be on? I really, I really kind of gave God control of my career. If that does that sound weird, like when I first started this, like yeah. I asked him to open the doors that needed to be opened and I'll walk through them, close the ones that I don't need to help mm-hmm. me control my calendar. Mm-hmm. And so looking back, I've just seen like these, it's like a roller coaster. It's like these times of extreme busyness. Yeah. And then there's times of nothing. Mm -hmm. feast and famine almost but as I was getting stressed over I don't have speaking things booked you know like the my first book released and you're supposed to be getting into the second book and like promoting all of that I know now I didn't know that then but I was thinking about it at the time um things weren't opening up and so having to trust that okay I I asked God to help me with this Mm -hmm. I need to trust that like as long as I'm putting forth the effort that he'll bring the fruit and when there's not fruit, you start thinking, did I do something wrong? Like where, yeah. where is the line between trust and my work yeah. part? Yeah. But I look back and I see, you know, I, we moved to Biloxi for mm-hmm. six months and like, I wouldn't have been able to go and do some of those speaking engagements. And then all of a sudden I would start getting three or four in a row. And I thought, okay, God's got this started again. Yeah. And that very early in my career taught me to never stress about these things that he will always bring them in as long as I'm doing what I'm supposed to. And if there's silence for a while, if I can say, yeah, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, then maybe something else is coming that he's prepping the way for or protecting that for me. And so I try to keep that in mind and just looking at, you know, he's always faithful. Oh. It's just not the way that we expect it to be sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. God, you know, he does not make sense most of the time. <laughs> um, you know, I've said this a lot. He's the best puzzle maker. Because, you know, you just don't get like, well, how are these pieces going to fit together? Like, what are you doing, God? And then when you step back and see like the big picture, it's like, I get it. Like, that's exactly why. And, you know, what I love that you, you know, you brought out is that, uh, cause I, I do this. I feel like we have a, a similar, you know, personality where, you know, when things are silent, you wonder, am I doing something wrong? And so right. I, I love that, you know, you brought out the fact that you gave your writing career to God, like right you know right when you started out and trusted him for everything and you know a lot of writers you know they they do that but sometimes it's hard it you know it's easier to do it than you know actually follow through with those actions um so i would love for you just to tell them what a release what a weight it is when you fully give god control and say okay my hands are off i will put on the put in the work but you orchestrate the details god it's so, so true. And I think, um, I think where we falter in it is that we don't put the work in. Yeah. And so like, it's easy to, like, I've heard, you know, writers especially say like, well, you know, if God wants the book to be a bestseller, it'll be a bestseller. And they use it as an excuse to not market, right? Like if God wants it to be, I'm like, well, there's truth to that. Like, I understand yeah. what you're saying, but yeah. like, I don't think that God like just, oh, you know, like, that's why I always have to go back and say, okay, did I do everything that I could do to give? And I kind of think of it as like, 
not to be irreverent um because obviously he is like sovereign and our, yeah. our father but like if you can think of it in terms of a partnership like if you feel like you're doing god's will here and you're saying please help me protect my calendar please open doors for me mm -hmm. you have to do your part and so, so i kind of see it sometimes like okay i'm i need to do X, Y, and Z to allow God the room to then come in and do what he wants to do. Like if I don't make certain connections or I don't put forth effort, he can't bring a blessing there because I didn't open the door for him to open a bigger door. Does that make sense? Like so I, God yeah. doesn't always work that way, but just kind of like trying to think it out loud. Yeah. No, I love that. I love the fact, I think that if people looked at it more as a, a partnership, because God is a relational God. Mm -hmm. And if they looked more, you know, on it as a partnership, I think that that would help them, you know, so much. Because like you said, like, God will open the doors, but he expects us to put the work into it. And I think that, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's, you know, perfect advice. And I think it, it, think, think it would take a lot off of people, you know, stress-wise, burden-wise. And yeah. you know, I'm super analytical. So I have to think through all, like, you know, everything. So if I just simplified it like that it would, yes it would it would help so so much so I think I think that's perfect and you know as we as we wrap up here um this I think is the most Im important question because people you know need to hear this from what you've experienced but how would you encourage people that are going through a, a similar mountain that you are in the sense where this mountain and Satan are attacking them at the very essence of what God's put them on this earth to do. How can they keep climbing and realize that sometimes a mountain is a mountain of constant climbing and the victory is determination, perseverance, I'm not gonna give up, and not always a mountain or a, a victory of uh, healing. Mm -hmm. how, how can yeah. they like, you know, overcome that? Because sometimes that's hard but you still got to do it and realize the victories in that you didn't give up. I love that. I love what you just said. And I think to maybe offer some practical tips, um, if you, part of overcoming is like, you can't do everything. And so I think saying, okay, what are the things that only I can do and that I have to do? Yeah. And so like my husband's tried to give me like um, voice to text dictation software, like all these things I wouldn't have to type, but I, I speak differently than I write. Like, so I know writers will understand that speaking voice versus the writer's voice. And so that doesn't really work for me. I, I don't know sometimes what I'm thinking unless I'm actually typing it out. Mm -hmm. So because my fingers have to touch this keyboard, then I think where are areas that I can not have to touch, specific to me, not touch things. Yeah. And so like for your audience, like what areas are areas that you can have someone else or something else to do? So like when Justin's deployed, I'm unashamedly like doing shipped orders or like sometimes it's Uber Eats or whatever, like saying, hey, I'm going to invest a little bit extra yeah. funds maybe over here because I don't have time to make dinner tonight or I don't have time to go to the store yeah. or like my kids, they, they touch things for me, meaning dishes or laundry and different chores, which is great. But it also means that it's constantly me like following up, like it'd be faster to do it myself, yeah. <laughs> but but just trying to say, okay, in my situation, what are the things that I have to do? And then how can I best pass off mm -hmm. or delegate some of these things? Yeah. And that could be assigning people things or using funds or something. But yeah. I don't, giving up because of it, I think that that's sometimes how the greatest stories are told. They're because people have persevered. And I think God gets the glory through that. He doesn't get the glory if I quit because of this. This isn't this. I mean, I deal with this pain like every day. So it's becoming a normal thing. But it's not enough to stop like I can't yeah no you, you can't because I mean look at look what God's used you to do like so many people have the writing careers that they do and believe that they can because you poured into them and they wouldn't have had the belief of their purpose if you know you quit and so I, I can't thank you. No, I'm one of those people and, you know, I appreciate what you've done for me. And, you know, so I, I just, like I said, I can't thank you enough that you didn't quit. Oh, I mean. and, um, I, uh, I just, you're just a testament of like what God can do if you push past the pain and the hurt and you rely on his strength, because this is what you show this truth and your strength comes 
from the right source. There's not a mountain you can't climb.